coming up. A uh, really cool conversation with a hilarious duo who really helped originate geek rock uh, with an alternative vibe. They were used to writing one minute songs, that was their forte, and then they sprung up from the underground and sold a million records with a masterpiece album that contained one of the most explosive, ear-catching songs of the early 90s. Both members of the duo tell us how being the album of the month for Columbia House's famous eight albums for a penny offer, you know, that offer helped them to break through. Actually, I think it was 12 cassettes for a penny and eight CDs. Anyways, coming up on Professor Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. We invite you right now to join this community of music celebration. We have interviews, we have videos, the stories behind the songs, uh, really curating the history of the rock era. Subscribe below to get that, to never miss out. Also, look at our Patreon. We have a lot of additional content there, and that support helps us so much. So it's time for another episode of our series, Breakthrough. This is where we pinpoint the song or event that helped an artist or band kick open the door to long-term success. Today, we're going to go behind one of the great feel-good indie songs of the 90s, Birdhouse In Your Soul by the duo They Might Be Giants. Make a little birdhouse in your soul, not to put too fine a point on it. It's a song that just is a jolt to the system. It's a total bad mood killer. You can't listen to this classic song without a, a huge smile on your face. It's just so joyful. Blue canary in the island by the light switch, who watches over you? It came from the outstanding album Flood, which was the soundtrack to, to many of our lives, especially if you grew up in the, the late 80s, early 90s along with uh, insight from other great songs from the Platinum album, including Istanbul. They'll go into a lot of these songs. Istanbul, Constantinople, now it's Istanbul, Constantinople. And tell us the story behind them, including Birdhouse in Your Soul. They kind of talk about how they came up with it. First started out as a one minute song and then they had some producers to help them extend the song. Anyway, I'll let them tell you about it. I have a special place in my heart for They Might Be Giants for sure. Now, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, as we go into this interview. Make sure that you click on the link below to go to zenny.com to choose from hundreds and hundreds of frames. You choose the style, the color, the shape, and then you can use Zenny's mirror feature to see what you look like. You do a virtual try-on there, and you can see it. Zenny.com. Here is John Linnell and John Flansberg with the story of the two Johns. In the end, by the light switch, who watches over you? Make a little bird. Birdhouse in Your Soul, when I was in high school, I remember I would turn up the part when you'd start to hear you kind of meander in with your I'm your only friend, and all of a sudden, with that beat that comes in, it just boom, yeah. it hits you. Where did you come up with with that beginning? Like, where did that hmm. come from? Well, there is this, there is um, a really old-fashioned trick that we utilize on the Birdhouse in Your Soul uh, mastering, which is we made the intro much quieter than when the beat starts. It actually is volumetrically much lower. Really? Yeah. And it and like when the beat starts, it gets Yeah. If we did I don't think, I don't think, I don't think we invent that but it was a famous album yeah. that began that way. But it's a yeah, very yeah. Yeah. it was a very purpose it was a very purposeful thing yeah. to sort of like it go actually gets into the song long enough that People might actually be sort of adjusting their. That's right. Yeah, themselves. I think actually that was the that was the mistake Elvis Costello made was yeah. too short on the quiet. Yeah, he should have yeah. waited longer, and then people well, would turn up there. Elvis, call us. We can help you little, with that. Little, little tip. <laughs> little, just a little advice. <laughs> but uh, it, you know, it was a. Uh, the whole electric experience was kind of was kind of intense because we had really been. We had been working with a great independent label, but it was a very small organization. It was really mm -hmm. one guy. Um, who was working the phones while we were on the road doing all these sort of local shows. And moving to Electra was suddenly a huge team of people, all, uh, you know, very, you know, personally, they're all very personally ambitious. You know, it was a big music business place to be, and everybody wanted to have hits. And um, so, you know, there was some, it wasn't, we didn't, weren't fighting with people, but we had to have a lot of conversations about everything with people. So like kind of figuring out what a single would be or should be suddenly became like a topic, which it had never really been before. We had just made records and certain songs, like with Don't Let's Start off the fir our first album, that was really a DJ in Pittsburgh saying like, this is a cool song. Like that was this sort yeah. of old fashioned rock and roll, like kids are going crazy for this song, this Don't yeah. Let's Start song. Don't, don't, don't let's start. 
start. I've got a weak heart and I don't get around. And that's how it became a single. Right. We, we never picked it as a single. We didn't think of it that way. But when we moved to Electra, we really had to sort of have our heads adjusted on that kind of trans- thing. Yeah, transition. But the nice thing was that Electra was also, I mean, they did a lot of things the old fashioned way. They just spent a lot of money on it. They hooked us up with these super fancy English producers, Clive Langer and Alan Winstanley, who oh, yeah. were excellent at their jobs. They were working and, on Bone and Drag at the time. Yeah, right? yeah, they just finished that. and. Um, and they were just great guys. They were really easy to work with, and they taught us a ton of things. And you know, John had made the demo to Birdhouse. And it was a, a really like a pretty powerful kind of demo, and you could tell that it had something really great there. They really kind of lashed their sort of Saturn V booster rocket onto it. Yeah. And, uh, well, they, part of it was like, it's got to be longer. Well, right. That, <laughs> it had, yeah. it had yeah, to be, yeah. you know, I mean, we, we, if it had been the previous album, we probably would have been like, hey, it's a minute long. It's That's done. Good. It's done. <laughs> so, so they were, but they were just great guys and, they, and we learned so much from them. It was really, um, it was really inspiring to, to work with people who, weren't afraid of, I mean, part of it was that they were really into weird ideas. Like they really yeah. felt like they were looking for things that stuck out. They wanted their, they knew that part of making a popular song was having it be different. And, yeah. uh, and that's, that is unusual. You know, a lot of people are just trying to figure out how to fit in. They were trying yeah. to figure out how to do something cool. I have a secret to tell from my electrical well. The video is so iconic. I remember when I first shot on 120 Minutes and you guys have that jump dancing thing that you do. And yeah. I remember me and my friends were a bunch of nerds. And so we were always trying to figure out how Very to- Very easy dance. How to mimic <laughs> People that, with no you know? background in dance can, yeah. can master. <laughs> and then printing off the eyes and cutting them out and putting them on. Yeah, I think we were, we sort of set ourselves up for people to, you could, you could have the home T- TMBG kit. kit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. We probably and should have encouraged that more. Also the end, when you keep going over, it's almost like at the end of God Only Knows when you've got those three parts oh, sure, going yeah, on. sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And even though I've heard it 597 times, it still makes the hair on the next stand-up every time. It's just this, oh, this, re- nice. this song that just makes you, it's an anthem. In fact, I have a theory that if everybody would listen to that song every day when they wake up, we'd have world peace. Oh, I think I, you're right. I do. It's there's just no such basis a happy for thinking little that. cheerful song. Yeah, that's so. interesting. Well, it's you know, there, uh, amongst the songs that we've done, I think there's something very um, odd and and kind of thoughtless in a way about the way that song was created that makes it sort of hard to reproduce. You know, right? Because it's not there's no obvious formula for a no. song like that. Like the the drum the drum beat is upside down. A lot of formal things about that are kind of wrong. And yet it, it all it all seemed to make intuitive sense. So, right. and that was partly you know it was partly the song, and it was partly due to Clive and Alan uh, coming in and 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 recognizing what what they thought was good about it. I remember when I got the CD through Columbia House, I'd sign up under eight different names, and my dad would be like, "Who's Peter Reader?" Right, right. <laughs> well, what is this? Twelve for the price of one, or whatever. And that's right. how I got all the They Might Be Giants how and the Smiths and yes. all those albums. Well, it was a big thrill for us to be picked to be part of the Columbia mm-hmm. because there was the Columbia Music House had a little flyer, and you could yeah. there was always a certain set of albums that you could get for a penny if you joined. And it wasn't like just any album. It no, was, it was, was like there was like forty albums, and some of them were you know. Conway Twitty's greatest hits. Like maybe not, <laughs> right. maybe not the thing you want to get. <laughs> exactly. But for some reason. <laughs> Uh, in 1990, for a very long duration of time, Flood, the album Flood, was a pick in the Columbia Music House. And Apollo 18 was, too. Yeah, I remember yeah. it was the album of the month. You sign up, you pay the penny, and then, you, then you've, you're then you done. You're like, oh, I've decided <laughs> not to join. Well, my dad made me buy the five at regular price. Oh, he did. Yes, yeah, he did. Right. Because but, he but, was but, like, but you, you know. I, see, I wasn't really tuned into that thing, but may, that may actually be the whole secret to our success, is that <laughs> one Columbia House It was, thing, it was like, a good deal. Well, the album yeah. went platinum, so yeah. it certainly helped with that. Not to put too fine upon on it, say I'm the only being you're... I remember a few years ago when I heard an Art Mooney song, Bluebird of Happiness. Bluebird of Happiness. 
Bluebird Factory. It came out in 1948. Did that at all come into enter into the mind when you were doing? I don't know the song. Do you mean the Art Mooney song or, or, or the Art Mooney song when you were doing Birdhouse in Your Soul? Oh, uh, I don't, I don't think so. I, uh, yeah, just a fun little coincidence. I mean, it doesn't say anything close to we'll Bluebird House of Soul. It, it. <laughs> it just said Bluebird of Happiness in the song a few times. But there probably was something very uh, uh, intuitive about the lyrics to Birdhouse. It was not a very obvious kind right. of a formal kind of thing. It could have really come out of thin air. I, 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 don't, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I'm not familiar with the song you're yeah. talking about. Tell me about Particle Man. How did that come about? Too. Particle Man, Particle Man, doing the things a particle can. I mean, the Tiny Tunes was, we actually just lucked into that. They just, mm -hmm. they just approached us and we had, it was involved no work on our part. Particle Man, Particle Man. A very easy way into a completely other uh, audience yeah. for us, which obviously turned out to be huge, I guess. Doing the things a particle can. Well, the, the the demo of of Particle Man was just like a banjo, uh, and, <laughs> and I don't know how it wound up sounding the way it did. I guess I guess we had, you know, we did we did some stuff with uh, Alan Bazzozzi on that yeah. one, I guess. Yeah. So the demo yeah. had had some other, you know, musicians and stuff, and it 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 was a built up version of a very very simple song. What's he like? It's not important. Particle Man is he a dot or is so Istanbul, I mean, where did you get the idea to cover that? Did your parents show it to you? Or? Well, actually, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Istanbul is actually a cover, which is always disappointing to us because it's right after they tell us that it's their favorite song. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's, it, it was originally a hit in the 50s, right. you know, in that sort of how much is that doggy in the window pre-rock era uh, for a group called the Four Lads. But they in Constantinople should be waiting in Istanbul. My mother and my aunt would uh, sit around and play the piano, and it was actually one of the songs that they played all the time. So I was very familiar with it. And um, it's a very simple song. It only has two chords. Um, and then later on, uh, there's a, a, a group that was very influential on us uh, called The Residents, did a song called uh, Constantinople, which is sort of this weird morphed version of Istanbul, uh, Constantinople. When we first started touring, we were booked in Norfolk, Virginia at a, at a, a place called the Ram's Head Inn, which is basically like a place for um, enlisted men who are like in training would go out and get completely blotto drunk and they would just have college bands come and play you know a lot of times there were cover bands it was a very indistinguished venue just plugged into a month of shows you know mm -hmm. it was like the seventh show of seven days and uh but one of the things in the contract that they would not relent on was that we had to play for two hours and we were coming from new york where our sets were 20 minutes long you know, nobody, you know, bands were kind of just like a little bit right. of uh, And this was 18, little, playing 18 songs. Yeah, I mean, our songs, were really, <laughs> our songs were really short. We figured out how to get it up to 20 minutes. Right. And that yeah. seemed like a victory. But so to suddenly have to figure out how to play two hours worth of music was a huge challenge. Sure. And so we basically started, took on a bunch of covers. We, start, we learned um, Why Does the Sun Shine, which is a cover that we played to this day. The sun is a We learned Istanbul, basically, again, because it was a really simple song to play. You know, we kind of already knew how it went. Istanbul, even old New York, was once New Amsterdam. And then as it, the show evolved, they became popular songs in the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, But we were doing Istanbul for a, a, a fair bit before we recorded Flood. And then when we got, uh, when we started production for Flood, there was this fantastic casio sampler that uh we both we both bought one with our record advance money yeah. to make our big major <laughs> label album and um so we had this kind of fancy piece of equipment and one of the things that when you have a big fancy piece of equipment you need to do i mean everybody who's bought a camera knows this it's like you got to test it i actually my like first initial test of the thing 
was to put together an arranged version of Istanbul because we've been doing it just as a duo, yeah. really as a folk song with no drum machine or no, no accompaniment. So I put together this very elaborate kind of homemade sampled arrangement of it. And that was what became the, the recording that's on Flood. Constantinople got the works. That's nobody's business but the Turks. It's a shaggy dog story, but, uh, but you know, the song, I mean, it goes all the way back to my childhood, but it also, you know, it was yeah. also the beginning of a lot of sampling and uh, electronic music for us. I want to ask you about Minimum Wage because that's a song that I always use. When you were making mixtapes back in, in the day for yes. a girl, mm -hmm. I yeah. always put Birdhouse in Your Soul and some of those, but I always put Minimum Wage because you'd always have like 30 seconds left when uh, the tape yes. was over right, and you'd right. time it right, so you'd throw in Minimum Wage. The DJ did, special. Yeah, how did that, that come about? <laughs> uh through working a lot of minimum wage jobs <laughs> and uh, be, sort of being, uh, you know, preternaturally embittered by the experience. It's a drag yeah. working those jobs, you know? And uh, I was, I mean, I was recently did an interview with the, the Onion uh, AV Club people and uh, they were like, what was your worst, you know, they have a list of questions that they ask everybody. And it's like, what was your worst job? And I was like, that's like an eight-way tie for last. It's like, you know, be parking cars or removing, right. or removing staples from medical documents or, Ugh. you know, I mean, you you name the sort of boring, mind-bendingly dull job. I've I've probably done it. You know, it was definitely a period. Like there was like a seven-year period in my life where that was that was what it was. <laughs> Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Birdhouse in Your Soul and Flood. They might be giants below. Tell us your memories about this group. When did you first hear their music? What are your favorite songs from this album? Celebrate this, this brilliant band. Uh, let's have a great discussion below about them. Uh, if you like our content, we do invite you to join our community by subscribing below. It's so great to hear from other fans out there and uh, to share this joy in music. You can also become a patron at Patreon. And uh, all of it's about keeping the music alive. That's really what we're here for. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.